Please join me in welcoming Professor David Schreier. Who's read Twilight? Two of you? <laughs> the world is a happier place than I thought. <laughs> Oh, I'll cut the comparison short then, but, but you know, suffice it to say that um, Native American literature is, is sort of um, foggy and misty and uh, typically concerned with, with matters of great import um, and um, it's got all sorts of you know, earth tones to it. And um, I think, you know, in terms of my experience, I'm, I'm living proof that, that life more often than not transcends or exceeds or refuses to fit very neatly into the categories that we try to impose on it. And at least my life does, and I think all of our lives do. And I think the best literature does the same. And so what I was trying to do with this piece was to do some, do some transcending. To try and, and go at least with my subject in some ways that, that some people might consider ill-advised, but I consider um, worth, worth exploring. So with that, <coughs> And besides, in being a Minnesotan, there's a long history um, of Minnesotans writing about um, college. Scott Fitzgerald wrote about college. He's from Minnesota. You know, so, so if he got to do it, then, then I get to as well. And Scott Fitzgerald had his Princeton novel, and uh, if he gets to do it, so do I. And so this is, this is, this is a kind of, um, I don't know what you call it, uh, a love triangle identity caper. <laughs> called Running Berenstein set on, at Princeton. Um, but don't ever imagine that this is in any way autobiographical. <laughs> it's protagonist, well you'll see, I'll start. I'll read for a bit and then if I'm going too slowly I'll hurry on and then we can do questions and answers and stuff like that. It was on a sunny, hot Monday afternoon in September 1989, the first day of Princeton Freshman Week, the last day of sun until Hurricane Hugo finished its work on the Atlantic seaboard a month later, that Carrie Hodes, with running Bernstein trailing along behind her, lost in the wash of her perfume, his eyes on her tan legs, legs he thought of as rich legs, and therefore belonging to Princeton as much as to the girl, dropped down with a sigh in the Witherspoon common room and told us the tragic news. Witherspoon, a stately Victorian Gothic dorm of granite and brownstone with Boston ivy that clung to its base and crawled up to peak inappropriately in the second story windows, sat at the center of Princeton's green heart. In that heart, beating strong amid the comings and goings of parents as they brought their children to spend yet another year learning in paradise, beating in time with everyone's hopes and aspirations, beat on innocently outside of Witherspoon common room as Carrie told the group what had happened. The common room itself was dark and covered with brown carpet and always smelled to us of burnt popcorn. Did you hear, she asked as she slumped on the couch. Lyle's dad is dead, his mom too. They were killed in their living room. Not killed, she corrected herself. They were murdered. He won't be coming back, Lyle that is. I don't think, how could he after that? How could he? How could anyone? Oh, God, it's all so fucked up. It's all so fucked up. She shook her head wistfully, not quite sure that such a thing could happen, and at the same time, thrilled that their lives were touched, however remotely, by tragedy. A tragedy, the news of which was just then, as they gathered in that last day of sun, spreading across the country. It was sad, and it was awful. Before too long, the murders would be awful for being famous, or famous for being awful. Bernie Bernstein stood at the door, not sure if he should enter the common room, his presence largely unnoticed, obscured by the sudden, bright, blinding joy of tragedy. A tragedy that for once touched what was, for most students, the magic sphere of Princeton. A place that conferred degrees after a rigorous course of study, but because it was Princeton, conferred both power and invulnerability, or was supposed to, as did membership to the group. To belong to the group, to hang out with them, required many things. Among them was that you had to adhere to a creed, part of which was that you had to pretend Saeed Hamid didn't stay up half the night studying and get up at 6 a.m. in order to hit the books again, and that Carrie Hodes, pretty much the den mother, if the den was lined with sex, was just friendly and didn't have to try 
and that she didn't anxiously read the faces of the men she brought back to her room and lie awake afterwards and wonder, after they had left, if they still thought of her. Or that Matt, far from having nothing to do, made sure to work in the dining hall during the breakfast shift and do all his reading between four and six in the afternoon so he could swing by and hang out because he'd cram for the exam if he needed to. Anyone, anyone caught trying too hard to belong, wanting too much to be included. Anyone who admitted to looking forward to the evenings when they would hang out and shoot the shit for whom Princeton was the target and the group was the center of it was banished. You must want to belong without trying. You'd hear it said about this or that person, oh, he's okay, but you know, he just tries too hard. Wanting and trying were forbidden. Everything else was fine. As for Ronnie Bernstein, he wanted more than anything to make an impression on Michelle, who we haven't mentioned yet because she was just that way, totally fine with being the last introduced, the last one noticed if noticed at all, who never really drew attention to herself, who sat quietly on the floor in the corner of the common room, stretching her hamstrings. But of all people, Running Berenstein was the most likely to try too hard, the least likely to compliment the group. He gave himself away by showing he cared about himself, and that he cared about his place in the world, and he knew it. Being Jewish and being Native American meant, to him and his parents at least, that wanting and striving were the only reasons he was at Princeton. He was engineered to want. His father's Holocaust had lasted five years, his mother's for 500, or so he was reminded by his parents every time he failed to meet their expectations. When, for instance, he didn't do the dishes or fill the wood box or shovel the long drive down to the road or felt any sort of ennui, a word he discovered in the ninth grade but pronounced N-U-I because no one back home had any use for the word. <laughs> the only appropriate response to life, according to his parents, was to try, to work, to strive, to want. And he wore his earnest ambition at Princeton the way the fancy dancers back home wore their feathers. It was obvious on him. Even he knew he showed he cared too much. So he wasn't sure if Carrie brought him along in order to introduce him to the others, or because he happened to be the first person she recognized on the blue stone path behind Wig and Cleo after she'd been told what had happened to Lyle Menendez's parents. She had to process the news with someone. Maybe the news did what nothing else could, closed all the barriers that usually existed between people like Ronnie Berenstein and people like Carrie. <coughs> Finally, Carrie shook herself out of her reverie and seemed to remember that Ronnie Berenstein was with her. Carrie introduced him. You'll like him. He's cool. Too cool for school, he affirmed, after everyone turned to look at him. <clears throat> so, um, what's everyone up to? That's really messed up about Lyle's folks. Totally, said Saeed. Yeah, I know, totally. He was failing already. God, I'm like so tired, said Carrie to nobody in particular. For real, said Fosh. He rolled it. A cigarette of drum tobacco stood, stretched, and politely squeezed past Running Bernstein on his way outside to smoke. He nodded to Running Bernstein as he left, and Running Bernstein nodded back, though he was trying so hard to be casual that his head shook, and he took his hands out of his pockets to wave, shoved them back in, and then tried to recover by taking them out again. <laughs> Matt and Saeed were working on a problem set on the couch and barely looked up. Michelle was sitting on the floor. She smiled at Running Bernstein. She wasn't flashy or obvious like Carrie. She was dark, Filipino. Her skin, so dark and smooth and pure, seemed all the darker when, her, when she smiled because her teeth were so very white. It was hard to make out her body with any kind of accuracy since she always wore loose sweatpants and sweatshirts. She wasn't particular about makeup, and she put her hair, which she must have straightened, she put her hair up only to keep it from falling in her eyes, and that was all. But those eyes, large, liquid, and oval, bright and brown, made to seem all the larger because her face, indeed all of her, was so small, much smaller than your average human girl. When you saw Michelle, and before you knew her, you had the impression that the university had admitted a 12-year-old by mistake until she spoke. Her voice betrayed her, throaty, husky, 
with a temper that, like her eyes, betrayed some sadness or passel of regrets or lingering pain. Hey, Michelle. Oh, hey. Carrie looked up. You guys know each other? Same dorm, same RA group, said Michelle, still stretching her hamstrings from the floor. In Greek tragedy, too, last year, said Ronnie Bernstein quickly. And I saw you in 185 Nassau last year. I'm in creative writing. You're in dance, but only on Tuesdays. But it's not like it was every day or anything like that. But it had been like every day. And it had been like the highlight of all his days during his long, lonely freshman year. The thought that Michelle, who he knew hung out with the group, might be in Witherspoon was half, more than half, the reason he let himself be led there. Carrie rolled her eyes again. Oh yeah, said Michelle. So like, what kind of dance do you prefer? Asked Bernie Bernstein, aiming for nonchalance, but missing wide. <laughs> I mean, I know they have a good program in modern dance and expressive, but you must study ballet, right? Yeah, I did, as a girl. I've got a good build for it, and I have good teachers and all that, but it's limiting, you know, constraining, kind of. Did you know, said Bernie Bernstein, pulling out the best he had, did you know that Balanchine married an Indian? For real? Are you sure? He was Russian, right? I know, said Ronnie Bernstein, adjusting his backpack, and his eyes got a far-off, glazed look. He was Russian, that's true. But when he saw the Osage ballerina Maria Tallchief, she stole his heart. He couldn't believe such beauty and such perfection, and he felt he had no choice. He had to have her. And she fell for him, too. He was Balanchine, after all. And so the Russian married the Indian. <clears throat> And he said that he didn't feel truly American until he fell in love and married her. She's the one who made him American, kind of. In fact, he was about to continue, but he saw the rest of the room was looking at him as though he'd said something wrong. He retraced his steps, but couldn't find anything offensive, so he found where he left off and was about to continue. <coughs> anyway, as I was saying, they moved to New York. But then Matt said something low under his breath, and Saeed laughed. Bernie Bernstein stopped incanting and stammered off into silence. So, what happened? asked Fosh through the open window. I mean, what happened to Lyle's parents? Oh, God, said Carrie. They don't know who did it. It was awful. I mean, how awful. Seeing your parents like that? Lyle's the one that found them. And all the blood? Can you imagine? She covered her face with her hands. The papers carried all the details in the following weeks. Jose Menendez had been shot five times at close range with a shotgun. The gun had been placed against the back of the skull. The hole it made was so big, his brain had slid out of the cavity when they loaded him on the gurney. As for his beautiful wife, Kitty, she had been shot 10 times. According to the coroner's report, she'd been shot in the left arm and left breast and then gotten up to run. The next blast had broken her leg, at which point she'd, been, she'd begun crawling across the floor. She was shot three more times before the muzzle of the gun had been placed against her cheek and the final shot fired. It had dislodged all her teeth, one of which dangled from her gums. Her left thumb had been severed by one blast. These were the details that trailed after the corpses. But for the moment, the group contemplated their own parents, their own lives. And while none of them had known Lyle very well, Carrie had known him best, but because she'd gone to parties at the house he owned in Princeton, they all felt touched by the events that they were in it together somehow. That such threats existed out there stunned them. Someone could come into their homes, dorm rooms, classrooms, and hurt them. Bernie mm -hmm. Bernstein, and this was something else that made him different from his classmates, was raised with the belief that such things were not only possible, such catastrophic losses were likely. Violence was the norm. Violence, after all, was where he'd come from. They'd kill you if they could, said his father, in what passed for tenderness in his household. You've got to be tough or they'll get you, said his mother. They could be anyone. Nazis, white people, the establishment, people with power, those like the whites around the reservation, without it, workers, electricians, car salesmen, anyone. No one who wasn't family was considered safe because who, who could know? How could you ever tell what those strangers really wanted? Remember, his father would say, it wasn't Nazis that killed our family. The Nazis were just a party. It was Germans, Austrians, French. People killed us. 
People pulled the trigger and dropped the gas and fired up the ovens. Neighbors, just people. And it had been people, too, who stole the land and made the treaties and broke them and introduced smallpox and laid dissident, dissident Indians on the railroad tracks to get run over. This was what he was always reminded of. Running Bernstein's parents kept this in mind and kept reminding Running Bernstein to watch out, watch out, watch out. All of the group, Bernie Bernstein included, whoever, perhaps even all of Princeton and all of America had been trained to see the world then as a place of threats, ready to rend the tender heart of America. And Lyle's parents had been murdered, so this proved it, and somehow it had happened to all of them too. Hey, so what are you? Carrie asked Bernie Bernstein. I mean, aren't you some weird mix or something? Basque and Fijian or something? <laughs> Well, I'm Indian, and wait, a feather Indian or a dot Indian? Well, a feather Indian, I guess. I mean, my mother's Indian. Not the kind of Indian I know, said Saeed. Not India Indian. No, but some scientists, well, a high plains on the horse surround the wagon kind of Indian, offered Matt. He was from Kansas. A movie Indian. Well, my tribe isn't from the plains, and I've never been in the movies. Not yet, he said, modestly. <laughs> Your tribe? Well, we all have tribes, you know. Some of them are, well, so do Jews. Well, anyway, but my father's Jewish. That's weird. No, I mean, it's, it's not. It just is. So you're a Jew Indian? Well, I'm other things, too. Like, that's just too weird. Well, they're weird, but... Well, I mean, how does a Jew and an Indian meet? It was 1962, a good year. Running Bernstein closed his eyes and began to intone the myth of his parents' meeting. But what does that make you? I mean, half Jewish, half Indian, Carrie mused. She pulled her knee to her chest. And it was possible from where Running Bernstein stood in the doorway to see the smooth muscles of Carrie's leg all the way to the seam of her underwear. Running Bernstein backed out of the dead end story of his parents' love affair and changed gears and began navigating down a different story. Well, you know, Jews are Jews through their mothers, and Indians, my tribe anyway, are Indians through their fathers. So that makes you. Matt had looked up from his problem set. The last of the Jew Indians offered Saeed. And Running Bernstein felt like he couldn't win. The old creeping horror of his origins coming for him. That makes you, Carrie joined Matt in the brainstorm. Nobody, that makes me nobody, said Running Bernstein miserably, trying to cut the conversation short. Michelle looked up shyly from her seat on the floor. Like Odysseus, right? The Odyssey. Nobody. Like Odysseus. Running Bernstein closed his eyes in relief, and he felt a faint flicker of hope. Yeah, like that. I've got it, said Carrie, her eyes lighting up, powered by the battery of her own cleverness. I've got it. That makes you running, Bernstein. And then hope disappeared. Everyone laughed. Oh, God, that's good, said Saeed running Bernstein. Fosh, who had been listening through the window, took a drag on his cigarette, flipped it to the walk, and since it was beginning to rain, quickly walked back inside. Once there, he smiled and shook his head as he shouldered past running Bernstein, who still hadn't gotten any farther than the doorway. Running fucking Bernstein. Perfect. Genius. Too good, agreed Matt. Too good. Under darkening skies and rain that began that day and didn't let up till a month later, and by then the whole place was flooded, and they'd heard again and again the sad details of Lyle's parents. And chastened by the terrible news itself as much as by the new nickname that would stick to him forever and make him both famous and obscure, known and unknowable, Ronnie Bernstein left the common room with his backpack clutched to his chest and clutched along with it the mad hope, or was it just desire? that pesky, inappropriate wanting that dogged him so much. The mad hope, anyway, that Michelle might want him, might love him someday. Rene Bernstein hunched out into the rain. It was really coming down now, really pouring. Rain that seemed, since Princeton was that kind of place, to mirror so appropriately the sense of mortality, the sense of endings rather than beginnings, the sense of threat that had always been out there, but that was now here, stalking them among them to begin his sophomore year in college. Anyway, that's the first chapter. <laughs> <laughs>